Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Culturama. This is our keynote reading for the second weekend of, of Culturama. It's my favorite weekend uh, because I have we have um, really almost all of our sessions have been taught by former Mount Sac students um, and just so incredibly proud of what they, they're doing and what they've done. Today we've got um, uh, tonight we have two people uh, who are reading one Michael Torres and then we'll, we'll have Michael Sinap. Um, and uh, I'll give you a, a, just a quick introduction and uh, we'll have each of them read for maybe 20 minutes or something like that, uh, or however they, long they like to. And then uh, we will uh, have whatever questions and answers we you wanna have. Um, so, all right, Michael. Oh, thank you for doing that. Um, uh, so Tom just asked for the, the tra transcript to be en enabled and I did that. So you can turn that on if you're like me and you're hard of hearing, you can turn that on. So, okay, so uh, Michael Torres is a, uh, a graduate of uh, Mount Sac's English department, Mount Sac generally. Um, and he, uh, he went off to do really just tremendous things. He's got a, a fantastic book that I absolutely adore. He teaches at University of Minnesota in Mankato. Um, he's published all over the place, including the New Yorker. And he's doing uh, just fabulous things for his students. Um, I can remember being a grad student and the, the old professors used to bring us to their houses and, and we'd sit there and we'd, you know, feel really fancy. And so uh, Michael did that, I, I guess he did that today for his students. Um, so he's, he's becoming the fancy old man. So uh, Michael Torres. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I remember still going like to your place, uh, like not too far, the one you live not too far from Mount Sac. And like, I feel like someone has a picture of me like asleep under where like the stairs are like a weird space um, from back then. Uh, this is cool. I I'm like really excited to read. This is like, this is like a creative writing club meeting or something from Mount Sac from like back in the day. <laughs> so like, that's dope. Um, okay, so actually I'll read like, I'll read the first poem in the book, the last poem in the book, and then I'll like read some new stuff and just to try that out. And then maybe I'll end with um, the book again. Let me put a timer on. Okay. Doing donuts in the 87 Mustang 5.0 after my homie Chris gets broken up with I want to argue for the stars, but I find them missing through this window splattered with mud. Tonight, I sit shoddy and do not ask Chris if he's okay. This is the kind of loyalty I know, how the Mustang makes eights across the soccer field. I run my hand over Penny's Pepsi to the center console. That photo of his ex still blocks the speedometer and the next few years of his life have already begun to carve a cave. I pluck pennies into my palm. It doesn't take long for this story to burn through the field. The safety belt shocks my collar. Chris turns and aims for a gate without easing off the gas. I yell, fuck it, to whatever I can't hear him say. And isn't that why I'm here? To watch chain links swell in his headlights. I disappear the pennies with my fist. And, oh, thank you. And the, la the last poem in the book horses i want to write a poem with horses galloping through it but i don't know much about horses anymore except that they do gallop and i'm only reminded of this by a movie i fell asleep watching when i was a boy i'd watch through a fence as horses shook their manes and galloped around the ranch next to where my grandfather lived perhaps that part about galloping isn't true i follow my imagination more than i should at least far enough to end this poem with a charge of horses departing in a cloud of dust or however it is they vanish because they do. To be honest, my friend was the one who loved horses. And if I'm going to tell you everything, I was in love with her. This was years ago in college. Isn't that a great way to start a love story? How would you write it? Would you include the sycamore tree, sunlight climbing through it, the shade we sat under? afternoons and a campus slowly emptying. Maybe all you need to know is I wanted her and I to work out long after we didn't. 
long after we met up as friends at a pizzeria near campus where we talked about her mother and sister and that cousin who shoveled dirt every morning timing himself because he wanted to be a firefighter. All that reminiscence as a way of saying, look at what bolts around inside us. I know this poet who hates when poets use the word love in their poems. She turns the page on the word, I've seen her do it, but I wonder what she places there instead. I picture a pothole, it's open gazed, crushed clean by rainwater and tires. I picture a parade of silver fillings, the mouth waiting to snap something in two. I was listening to this podcast the other day where a poet explained how hard it is to write love poems. The problem is, he said, there's no tension in the love I have for my wife. In my headphones, I heard the interviewer exhale and recognize the ache it floated from. It was a horse galloping over a hill. There was a pause. The poet said he might never write a love poem again if all goes well. I laughed in my kitchen. I'd been washing dishes. My wife was getting ready for work. In the background, the clink of silverware. They were in a restaurant. I couldn't tell a fork from a spoon and that bothered me. I listened for a clatter of neighboring tables. The poet's words slipped into a whisper behind everything. Sounds of metal washed over the interview and isn't love like that. A shift of attention the heart demands, a refocusing. I think the poet I know would be proud of this poem, how it advances to the tall grass by itself, how it refuses to sunset. Sometimes leaving doesn't mean anything besides ember fading under earth. Another window in my house is broken. This time it's the bedroom. Our neighbor, this kid, has trouble learning when to let go of a baseball. After the shatter, I found a jagged hole and stuck my hand through. I waved him away. Later, I covered the frame with plastic and told myself I'd fix it in the summer. It's October now, and it keeps the cold out. The plastic sheet doesn't bother me except at night when a wind traffics through town and my ear bends toward the window's new breath. Tonight, my wife snores and I am awake. I press my palm to the blurred window. Beyond, someone dreams of smoke and salvation. I know this. I move closer, watch for clouds grazing in the prayer field, and maybe I ask for nothing at all. Okay, thank y'all. Um, I'm gonna read some new stuff, and I all the new shit that I'm writing is like I don't know what's going on, and I want to not know what's going on with. I'm just writing a lot at once, but like all these like very drafty revisions and of uh, poems and like some of these that I'll these that I'll read are like the ones that are sort of like seeping up and it's interesting in the way that they're sort of speaking to the pre this book or the, like the previous whole thing that I was working on uh this one's called alabaster it's been so long since I've tried to write a love poem maybe I could start somewhere unexpected as a way of getting out of my own way like with the word alabaster, which makes me think of a town in the South, though I've never been to the South, unless you count Florida. I don't count Florida. Florida is just Florida. Alabaster sounds like it could be also be something you hang on a wall in your house. It escapes from the mouth saying alabaster. Try it, alabaster. Love should be like this, no? Escaping from inside you. You should put love up on a wall somewhere. This can still be a love poem. I believe it. I believe in it. If I'm going to believe in anything else, it that's ev is it's that everyone becomes a blossomed branch unprepared to meet their shadow. That's what death is finally, isn't it? Meeting one's shadow. So much for love, unless I proceed with the fact that in the dark, we need not worry about shadow, except perhaps for whispers, which are a kind of shadows our ears snag on your lips to my shoulder, for example, or my lips at your neck in the quiet of our home where later we'll talk about all the things we want to hang on the walls that will tell others who we are. And then one day when we meet our shadows, those who knew us the best, We'll be burdened with removing the frames and we'll have to decide what to do with who we were. They'll fold our clothes into bags that will be given to strangers who will hang them lightly on their bodies. 
I always do this, you know, I get going on what it would be like for us together, even when we're gone. So thank you. So in the collection, there's like three or four poems about my brother's incarceration, which those poems, like two of them came like really quickly to me because I think I'd been thinking about then. What up, Michaelson? Um, and so um, I've been thinking, I think it was in the back of my mind to write about my brother's incarceration, but it was just like really hard to do until there was sort of like a call for those type of poems. And then like, they just kind of came out. But then this one, which is a new poem is sort of one that like, I was surprised because it's a, you'll see in the poem is like, it's about sort of like two different things happening, but like I was surprised that I was, that I would write about my brother's incarceration or like his post incarceration, like so easily after the other two were just way more difficult to write. Um, anyway, this is called Obad Desiring to Be in Ars Poetica with the release date inside it. My brother in the backyard sleeping hours after he gets out this image of him. And there I am far beyond it at a desk I've placed next to a window because of this life I've chosen with my pen and sheet of paper. Let me start again. It's early morning and my brother sleeps on the cement in the backyard. I don't know why. I don't know what, to, what I think this poem can do for my soundless brother, but my pen on the page where the image I've created of a brother alone with his sleep begins to draft also a ladder against the wall for my quiet brother to climb in the sweats he came home in. Once he wakes, awake brother, my mother asks what he's doing there, and there she is, my mother at the kitchen window overlooking the yard and the street beyond our house. The yellow plastic gloves hang over the faucet in front of her. They drip soap water right next to my lack of imagination. I've always placed my mother kitchen busy when all she wants to do is read a novel on the couch before getting ready for bed. She's been made to search each situation for what's better, for what can be navigated. She dries her hands and calls to tell me my brother is home now, finally. I haven't realized if this poem is about my own brother stirring towards chance or what my mother wishes for. One day, I called everyone to the front and announced that I was going to become a poet. Everyone nodded and hurried back inside. Everything was good for a long while. I grew strong, took out loans I intended to forget, piled up memories onto each page and felt sufficient. But look now, there is the morning miles out. It approaches my brother, my slim brother, who is about to blink, just like in a fable. My brother will wake up, he must. My mother can't find her glasses. She goes outside, offers my brother a basket of oranges. She hopes he holds like a chalice. I write small clouds in there. They pass above him. Every star exits on a blue string. Thank you. Um, I don't know why I'm so against, like, I'm a, I'm a fucking dad now. And I'm so against like writing poems about like with my daughter in it. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like, uh, no, but like, but then I just do it anyway. Um, so this is called Of the Pine. Outside frosted stillness under chimney smoke, even squirrel prints on snow rattle a bit when light reaches them. Downstairs, my six, my six month old rattles what needs to be rattled inside her bounce chair. Sounds, sounds like ice cubes in a cup in someone's eager hands or a shoebox of walnuts that has been hurried through a room. My wife must be trying to eat breakfast, peanut butter on toast. Yes, I hear her tell our daughter hi. Then I hear the slight rattle, the spinning of whatever has been made to spin. Did I mention I was upstairs in the bedroom again, having detoured on my way to the bathroom? A small blanket with even smaller yellow ducks lies paused and scrunched at the center of our bed where our daughter must dream. I've seen her smile in her sleep, which led me to believe was the first time she could walk through a scrambled memory. Out the window where I've been watching chimney smoke disappear, 
a telephone wire cuts across, creases the sky, and there's the sun certain enough to jump the wire. For the past few months, most thoughts I have begin with, in five years or in 10, I hear my wife say, yeah, my daughter rattles everything. I watch smoke from the neighbors tumble toward a pine tree, then become something of the pine altogether. Let me see. Goodbye. Um, thank you all. Let's see. Let's see. So, um, my, uh, fortunately, this semester, my poetry workshop is working with um, this art class who they, they like, they're like have a broadside project and so me and my students got to like make poems that are gonna like have these broadsides done of them which is really cool and so but we had to like all of us had to sort of work with that um parameter of like only so many lines and so I have um a poem a poem that I that I one of the poems one of the two that I for that broadside project um and I've been trying, I forgot where, what I was reading, what I was listening to. I think it was like a Carl Phillips interview, but he was trying to say how like, he's been trying to write poems where the ending is so, like the ending is an image that's so surprising or like just very unexpected. Like he doesn't, he was trying not to like tidy up stuff. So I thought that was like kind of really interesting. So I'll read this new poem and then I'll go back to, for one more poem in the book and then I will hand off the baton and, and take the bench seat so I can listen to Michelson. Uh, this one's called Portrait of a Father at 76 with Son. My father wanted to help, so he decided to change the oil in my truck before I left. He didn't ask me, he just did it. I walked outside right as he began to examine the transmission fluids pool, the confusion it placed him inside of. He pointed, said, he thought, he thought, I yelled, I'll do it, not because I knew how, but because I didn't, and because I would have to learn how to become him while he watched my father, though not as much as before. I don't know if I can trust memory now. It is a friend who moved away. My father kept track of our shadows sliding across the driveway while I tried to adopt his heavy grunts. I followed his whistling with my own. When evening arrived, a neighbor listening closely might have heard the yelps of wolves tumbling into a singular dark. Yeah, I think this is cool. I never, I never do that. I love that. <laughs> um, I always uh, like reading this poem when I'm like in Pomona. So, and I'm in like Pomona right now, <laughs> uh, or as close as I get lately. Uh, my hometown is a man riding a bicycle with no chain. His legs a too quick clock, a kind of cruel that tells me any time away from home is too long. Pomona becomes a man asking if I want to buy his MP3 player. He raises headphones to my face. Listen, he says. No one believes him, but he doesn't say about what. It's how they say yes, but don't look. I nod. He talks about his daughter who works at AutoZone, AutoZone who's the manager now, the jefe. But his son, who I'm certain I went to school with, who walked into fifth grade one morning with shaved eyebrows and sat down without saying a word, who never spoke to anyone ever again, he does not mention, not even once. Where have all my classmates gone? Where I grew up has nowhere to live, but he says he'll be all right, he'll be all right, he'll be all right, because a lady from the next block over owes him for mowing her lawn. And have I seen a Bible around? No one's going to pick it up, he says, not unless it had $100 in it. Wouldn't that be something? He's nodding, he's balancing himself on the bike. He's trying to leave, but will I be here tomorrow? He might be around, my town's always around. So how about that MP3? I can keep it if I want, no. How about for 10 bucks? My town is presenting its callous palm now, my town relentless peddling, like everything is all right, like everything is all right, like a Ferris wheel no one's going to ride. Look at it, spin through the evening, each basket scooping sunlight, then shadow the carnival worker we turn away from calls for us and keeps calling long after he knows we're gone. Cool. Thank you all.
All right. Thank you so much, Michael. That, that's uh, American Sign Language for applause. Is this. I didn't know that. I love that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I do too. I prefer it to the, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so okay. Uh, talking about how this is my favorite weekend, one of my favorite people and my favorite uh, uh, students is, is Michael Sinap. And like, like with Michael, I'm just so proud of what he's done and what he's doing. You know, he's, he's a great writer. I think uh, more important to him that is that he's a great teacher um, and he's really found himself in teaching in the, the Inland Empire. Um, I admire what, what he does. I admire his poetry. I admire his teaching. So, uh, Michael Sinap. Hey, thank you guys so much for having me. Again, well, thank everybody for having me. Um, sorry, I was late. I got I was fixing my driveway. Um, I had to repatch the patch. We had to fix the main, and so I was just covered in blacktop. Um, I didn't even I didn't even change. So um, it does. It's got to get fixed. So um, so uh, I'm going to start with um, some hotel poems. Um, I used to work at this uh, Motel 6 in Ontario. Um, and I, I, I worked there for uh, almost exactly three years. Uh, I was a, uh, I was hired on to do the, the night audit, uh, which meant I had to learn how to do everybody's job before I could start doing mine. And then I would do my job and it, would it was just me and a security guard um and my job would start at 11 p.m uh friday nights um and i would get off seven in the morning the next morning uh and i did that while i was going to school so i did my best to um to never take a, a monday morning class uh because that would be like up all day work all night go to school all day and then come home so they would be like these 36 hour days and i had to do that one semester um it was just terrible uh there's a couple of days where i just couldn't do it and i wound up uh getting a hotel room myself just down the street from school i just couldn't drive um and it's been interesting looking back um and like one of the reasons why i quit and one of the reasons why i got the job was it helped me to sort of uh sort of grow a backbone right uh, sort of you know i had to stand up for myself i'm, I'm here alone at night there's a, a security guard who's really just there to like call the cops uh if something happens and um mostly what he did though was like walk around take towels to people who need towels um watch the desk while i had to go use the restroom and stuff like that uh, so I really had to like grow into my own, stand up on my own. Um, but you know, as this backbone started to, this sort of metaphorical backbone started to get, you know, grow and get firmer, uh, it started to get too firm, um, and I really started to uh, to not like what I did. Uh, I started to not like anybody who was there. Um, so I. Um, and, and as I've sort of, you know, and I left the job, uh, to focus on school and time has passed. And so I wrote this invocation, uh, to this sort of, uh, collection of, of hotel poems that are, that just start with, uh, the whole room numbers. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with the invocation and then, uh, do a couple of those poems. And then I'm going to move into a, a different sort of collection. Um, so invoca invocation to hotel collection. Sweet reader, the stage is the form into which these lives melt under lighter light into the corners and curves of this stuccoed cube in five parts. Our actors take the winged east facing driveways. They take the chain link and lemon tree path. They walk in from the north, breathe into this thickened rue. Their hearts beat strangely like our own. Sweet reader, 
Please shelter them below the box cutter edge of your love, a place dry and warm and just for tonight. Thank you. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of go uh, right into these, uh, these next uh, three poems. Um, which I realized, you know, these, uh, and, and as I was putting together these poems um, about a week ago, it was just sort of kind of stuff that's just been on my mind that I wanted to, to, to read and, and talk about um, in hopes that maybe it would sort of move something uh, in me or in, in, in everyone else uh, into, um, into something, right? Sort of a transformative, um, uh, type deal. So, um, 3.30. Into her mother's shape, she shrugs on her daily weight of skin, her skin at 17. Smoky years slip through sticky pink candles, swollen ankles, eyes round and raw, and the small claws of a cooper's hawk. Then come do the dark bags gone sideways inside civics to sideline the sweet stickiness in her stomach, spilling over September, split open across the crotch. Blood, no, blood. Stubborn still the bus sign is bent like the frayed denim strings around the ever smell of spoiled milk and earthworm stain through the snot and knots and salt and oh so close she is to the burnt sugar fumes off scorched tin foil to scare what scares her away that's like caramel she's told so close she is to a hand broken like a lock. Two forty two. Born beneath a dripping air conditioner boy, he is four and cannot crawl, waterboarding lullaby. Never learned to walk, boy, slumped asleep, stuck to his high chair, boy like a wet piece of paper on a table, boy. His parents have gone panning for gold. No, really. His grandmother writing letters with pencil to a prisoner, pleading for love come fresh, floor to ceiling, piled plastic bags of soiled clothes, anything can be washed and sold. She cracks the door to collect their mail. Color penciled heads of hummingbirds, junky dripping off the couch while only knows to curse boy, his name boy, even I holding their dirty finger sealed envelopes, staring through the crack, don't know, swears. The cockroaches scampering out can't be real. Um, uh, so I, yeah, one of the, so as I, as I go to this next poem, I realized, you know, one of the things is like all of these, these kids who have since sort of grown up um, since I was working there, um, a number of them I was realizing would be, you know, um, uh, aged to be a lot of, you know, uh, have aged into positions where they, they could conceivably be students of mine for, or current students of mine, things like that. Um, I'm thinking about some of the stuff some of my students are going through right now in the last couple of years. Um, and just, just trying to come to terms with like feeling what's going on and 
moving into like it, it, existing in that space, but not wallowing or dwelling in that space. Um, so some of these are so this, uh, the last sort of hotel poem. Um, sort of move into into this other uh, stuff. Um, and so um, one sixteen. Uh, one, her daughter waits in the car the whole time. A sophomore again, she's becoming all the world she sees above Motown blacktop. At Subway, 50 bucks goes a long way. A movie with red vines. Her daughter waits in the car the whole time. Phone light as good as starlight. Shooting at planes with wishes. Motels will make you sick with loneliness. Her daughter waits in the car the whole time. Her great Gatsby essay in her notes app. Teachers know no teenager gets good sleep. Even at a private school, cracks are wide and the gully between grades is too great for her friends to ford. They're in a new room. Two. Her daughter waits in the car the whole time. She takes her daughter to the beach. She sees her daughter drowning in Ontario and maybe Santa Monica can save her. Motels will make you sick with loneliness. They watch The Walking Dead with the duvet up over damp sheets. There's just the one bed here. There's still no one buying homes. She tells her, I was never any good at school, hon. Maybe I never tried. Maybe no one believed in me to my face before. Motels will make you sick with loneliness. She keeps a towel over the flat screen when it's off. Her daughter's growing her bangs. Three. Her daughter waits in the car the whole time. Her daughter's private school outfit fits her. At Subway, a hundred goes a long way. She shows her daughter movies. You've got mail, must love dogs, love actually, my big fat Greek wedding. Her daughter shows her movies, The Conjuring, Coraline, Jennifer's Body, Silent House. Together they watch Mamma Mia, because it's on, they say. Our towels will make you sick with loneliness. And our daughter waits in the car the whole time. She reaches out online to anyone. Our towels will make you sick with loneliness. She finds apps that keep messages secret. Four, our towels will make you sick with loneliness. It seeps through your skin. You linger in it long enough. It seeps into your muscles, your bones, like oil to an aquifer. If only this sickness slouched toward its cure, but loneliness yields just more loneliness. Her daughter waits in the car the whole time. The bread sitting, their shapes have shifted. Her mother tells her in public she's fat and nobody ever wants a fat ass. A daughter waits in the car the whole time, a glow in blue starlight, texting secrets. There are always men who'll say they love you. She finds them, they tell her, and she finds them. Uh, thank you. Um, so the next series, which is, uh, you know, um, weird and dark in a different way, um, is uh, I've been working for a long time on a series of poems that look at um, uh, indigenous history, uh, primarily as it uh, exists um, in the Western hemisphere. Um, 
within the borders of the extraordinarily young countries we currently call Canada and the United States. Um, and, um, and so it looks at history occurring um, there, and it also looks at um, uh, art history as well um, as these two ways to sort of um, find and locate my own uh, ways of looking into my own self, right? Um, sort of those are sort of like the three pieces through which it triangulates. And um, one of the things that I've grown obsessed with within this series um, has been art theft um, and, and art crime in general. Um, and so I did, uh, so this is a part of a series that I, sort of like a mini series within that um, or each piece looks at each, each one of the, the pieces within this sort of mini uh, unit is uh, from the Isabella Louise Gardner Museum heist, um, uh, which is I think about 30, which is about 30 years old now. Uh, not a single one of the pieces have been recovered. Um, and it's estimated to have been about a billion dollars worth of art stolen um about 13 pieces uh well not about 30 pieces there's 13 pieces that were stolen um and so connecting these two uh things um became an interesting thing for me um there's there's a lot sort of going on um and so the first one um uh, i want to do um as a study for the program one by Degas. Um, and are there these sketches that Degas had done for uh, this other um, for this for this other piece? Um, and so um, in keeping with that, it looks it's it you can tell a little bit easier on the page um, that um, these are sort of sketches of a palm. Uh, so they're uh, the palm is sort of sketched and then sketched and then sketched and then sketched. Um, all right, it's sort of Degas looking for this. I'm sort of looking at uh, looking for this as well. Um, and it's going to talk about a palm that I'm actually going to talk about later. Um, so one of the so uh, it's going to kind of directly reference um, uh, Rembrandt's uh, "The Lady and Gentleman in Black." Um, so, and it's looking at uh, the Métis contact uh, Louis Riel, uh, who is uh, at the time currently in exile. So these both take place uh, in 1884. Oh. In Rembrandt's The Lady and Gentleman in Black, the couple are not even close to each other. Their hands downturned, curled yet open, there are several theories why this was, a mistake, arthritis, metaphor, prude subjects. Some asked, in a work by an unparalleled master, why is there such a failure? Which of course presupposes art is supposed to be a certain way, that art which does not follow guidelines fails. Uh, in 1967, uh, the NCAA banned the dunk because Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was an artist with a basketball. The poets of the NCAA said it was an unskilled shot to say he was an unskilled player. So he invented the skyhook, one of the most difficult shots to make and almost impossible to block. This isn't good basketball if basketball is a checklist. There is greatness even where you don't allow for it. And it was revealed that Rembrandt had painted over the space between the subjects. It wasn't there when he originally finished the work. We know this because of the finish that seals an oil, uh, that seals an oil painting is required. Um, in Rembrandt's the lady and gentleman in black, there is a child between the couple. But this child is painted over by Rembrandt 
leaving an empty space. During the painting, the child died so deeply, they asked Rembrandt to paint the child out of the portrait, and he did. If you look carefully at the hands of the couple, you can see they're cupped to each hold one of their child's hands. The child no longer there. For me, this image is already powerful and speaks to one of the ways we can make an image. A second fractured so small, it's impossible to measure its distance from zero, except that we know it cannot be zero because here it is. The emotional relationship is described in metaphor and that metaphor is manifested. And here it's as simple, there is a space between them. So there is a space between them. And I don't know if you've ever known a couple who've lost a child, but this is exactly what it looks like. Two people in the same place separated by the memory of the kid who used to be there, but each of them holding on to that memory. Most relationships don't survive that kind of thing. A lot of people don't survive that kind of thing. When my wife and I went on a road trip after she got her first new car, we went to visit her family and that had all moved up to this island off the coast of Seattle. And her folks are pretty much all conservatively or all conservative, but thankfully I have some Ashkenazi friends on the island too. And my wife's family's suffered. They've lost people. They've had terrible unfairness visited upon them, around them. And every death is a caldera we walk around for eternity. Sometimes we complete the circuit. Sometimes we remake the circuit endlessly. Sometimes we'd never make it around one. Every death burns your guts together until nothing works. Every death eats someone else hand over fist. The children of genocide, we, we are born on the moon. And you hang out with folks who've never been, who look at the moon and see a bunny in the shadows of the ocean of tranquility, an ocean of emptiness, not even air, made from wounds next to wounds, next to wounds, next to wounds, next to wounds, next to wounds. There's no rim to that caldera. It's just more whole. And it's not even that they're conservative, dude, because the kinder, gentler machine gun hand sees a serious face or statistics through a telescope on a mountain that's just a mountain to them. I did the math one time. There's currently no height requirement for any rise of land to be defined as a mountain. It used to be a thousand feet. So I used that plugged it into the formula for the area of a cone. I'll spare you the calculations, but for those playing the home game, you'll also need to know that the human body takes 2.189 cubic feet of space. And you'll need to know that the reliable conservative estimates of the genocide of the Western hemisphere numbers 138 million people. And when you do the algebra, you find 1.15 mountains of dead bodies. Hyperbole fails in the face of precision. Go, out, stand, go outside and stand before a mountain. Don't fucking imagine a mountain. Go look at one from base to peak. It's all dead bodies. Anywhere you try to focus their limp eyes, twisted, bent arms, matted hair draped into someone's mouth. A shoe teeters off the edge of a toe painted light blue. It's a mass grave that stops clouds. 
So when I hang out with people who don't live every day, knowing they were supposed to be somewhere in that mountain, but who see a bunny in the moon. Anyway, I brought my Ashkenazi friends a pie because I was raised to have some goddamn manners. And we ate outside, looking out at the ocean through the cedars, talking about teaching and books and politics, telling stories in them and in the quiet, breathing in the quiet. Now my in-laws live in my house, have since late September of last year. Just a few weeks ago, Brian committed suicide. In Rembrandt's, the lady and gentleman in black there is a child. They aren't hiding behind a cabinet or peeking around a door frame. The child is there between the lady and the gentleman whose hands are downturned and curled and open. If by now you've scoured the painting and still don't see the child, it's all right. Many people have wondered at the hands of the lady and the gentleman and the space between them without seeing a child anywhere. As I assure you, there is. Scholars have theorized that perhaps the lady and the gentleman were prudish or arthritic. Some have theorized it was a mistake made by Rembrandt that the lady and gentleman should be holding hands. They are holding hands, the hands of their child who died during the finishing of the painting. When Rembrandt brought them the finished piece, they couldn't bear to see their child and not bury their fingers into his hair. They asked Rembrandt if he would paint out the child, which he did. We know he did. His paint lies over the finishing solution where the child ought to be. In their hands are empty gloves. For me, far removed from Rembrandt, or even Degas, who I, about whom I claimed this was in some way about a drawing of his, this image is already powerful. It speaks to one of the ways we make image because there is a distance between the lady and the gentleman. And I don't know if you've ever known a couple who've lost a child, but it looks like this. Um, and that's where that one ends. Um, and then um, in the last poem, I'll actually, um, this is one that's uh, 1633, A Lady and Gentleman in Black by Rembrandt. Um, and in 1633, a smallpox epidemic uh, cleaved through uh, what we know of today as Massachusetts. So. These days, I've been cooking with unsalted butter, like my friend Santi told me back when we were in Santa Fe. He says, you have better control over the flavor. If you want more salt, you add more salt. And these days I do. I keep salt in a bowl. I know by touch what goes into my body. And I get these little crystals beneath my nails. But this poem isn't about cooking. How can it be when these days we're dying by the thousands again and I watch from an unincorporated township in the San Bernardino Mountains, but it feels like I'm watching from space. That feels like ramming my fingers against the glass barrier between us all is as close as I'll ever get to holding the hands of the dying. See, my road to my own indige indigeneity is curved by tradition and bent by bullshit. So I don't care if we're not the same nation or even the same coast. 
my grandmothers died when I was 16. And my grandmothers are dying right now by the hundreds with eyes like two glasses without enough powdered milk in either, breathing from the bottom of their throat. That's where I should be these days. With no skill but a strong hand, full lips to kiss the canyons of their knuckles, to sing the songs about birds who leave in autumn, return in the spring with babies. I cover the hill in my mind's throat, wondering whether our songs will be enough anymore, since the birds don't stop here these days. But I'm not there. I'm writing a poem about cooking in an unincorporated township in the San Bernardino Mountains. And it seems like these days when I say I've been cooking a lot, uh, my guy friends still think that means there's something wrong with my wife and there isn't, but that there's this quiet red tree that grows through me, that is growing through the swelling and the leaves shirk. I raise a fist when I try to say something other than, I wish our oven wasn't broken so I could bake. Or that I'm excited to make something with these berries one of these days. Or that I shouldn't have any of this. That none of it matters. Not the butter, not the art history, not any of it. I should be where the people are dying alone. So when they walk on from this earth, it will be with a hand wrapped around theirs. That I've never felt more at home than in a motel room, ordering pizza from the only restaurant in town. And my dad is dying and I can't be there. So I don't give a fuck about turning graded essays back in a timely fashion, except grief won't pay my mortgage. That I like using cast iron because you have to care for it more. It takes more attention. Just a little more than another pan might. And in small ways, it gives back by giving away that love to those who eat my food, which these days I've been making with butter. I don't remember if I said that or not, but a poem should close like a cursive eye I hear. And now that we've did that part, one time my dad and I met my cousin at this shack behind his house somewhere in Coast Salish. My cousin had been given a bald eagle by a park ranger. Someone had shot it or it cut a power line with its talons. I don't remember, but it was on a table at enormous. And they agreed on something. And my dad poured molten, Morton salt all over this bird, massaged it beneath the down, wrapped a wing in red cloth. He taught me to break yarn with my fingers. He tied it. He wrapped the other wing. He told me to hold the body. And I put my fingers where his fingers were, warm on the cold bird. He said, look at me. And so I did. And he cut the wing off, cleaving through the taut joint. He put it in a cooler we'd brought with us. I kept thinking about the cleaver cutting my fingers off while he's being a fucking badass to nobody. Anyways, I don't think this arrives anywhere. And I don't know how to make sense of billions dead. Thank you. Thank you, Michaelson. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have time now to just have a conversation with the poets. Um, so if there's any questions, any comments you'd like to make, that'd be great. Um, please. I want to start 
and say that this last poem you read, Michaelson, where you said that the poem should end like the, was it the cursive eye? Like a cursive, yeah. Yeah, that was dope, like that image. Where'd you hear that from? Um, it, 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 would, it had been described in another way that like okay. poems should, poem should like make that circle, right? Like they need yeah. to tidy up, but then also lead somewhere a little bit else. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was like, that kind of looks like a cursive eye. Oh, I love that. To me. That's so, um, yeah, that was dope. And then, and then you were like, you, you said, now that we're done with that. And you said like one day, my dad and I, like that moment right there was fucking so dope. Like you fucking flipped it. So like, so unexpectedly, but like also echoing back to like the, the relationship with the father. And it was so, it was so, so it's a, such a good moment in the poem. Um, I do, I do want to ask like, cause you read from two separate, uh, like, um, you, you, you said that there are the two separate collections. So I just want to know, like, if when you work on them, do you, because the voices sounded totally different from the hotel poems and like what I'll call like your, the, the, the ekphrastic project. And so like, do you work on them like totally separately? Like, is it kind of like, you know, like if you like in high school and you have one table at lunch you go to, and then you have a different group of friends at lunch you go to and a different table, like, or how is it for you? Oh, so I a hundred percent, I had a bunch of, tables that i would go to in high school uh i had that i would just i could yeah i was just all over the place um yeah it's what's that like code switching kind of thing yeah yeah um so i i had i had a spot like behind the theater i would hang out with um i had this other spot we would uh we would just play like poker and there were chips, but we didn't, the chips didn't mean anything. And they just all went back in the same thing. So we technically weren't gambling. Um, I had uh, hung out with like a bunch of uh, guys who were like really into punk. So when, like, I want to say like, I hung out with a bunch of punks. Like they weren't like, they were, they were actual punks. They weren't like, that's not me trying to like uh, diss somebody. Um, but yeah, so it's like when I sit down, um to try to put something to paper um it's one of those times where like i let kind of like how i'm they say like don't use inspiration right like you use um or don't use it don't rely on inspiration right rely on the muscle right um and it's one of those moments where like kind of depending on like how i sit down what i'm sort of feeling that day if i'm if I'm pissed off or, or something like that, or introspective, then um, I'll, I'll, I'll write a lot of the, I'll, I'll work on um, the, the ekphrastic work, right? Um, which takes a bunch of research too. So sometimes um, I said, well, you know, my, my writing time is spent doing um, poetry research. Um, but then there are other times like the, the motel poems you know, like each pro I don't know I don't know how it is for you but for me like right like you try to it's you're writing to try to like become like a I don't know for me like be trying to become a better version of uh of of me or become a more honed version of me and so those motel poems are me trying to that that invocation is to me as well right like try to find a way and, and even if it's just through the voice to care about people who it's really easy not to care about, um, that it takes work to do that. And who, you know, like a lot of those people who, and it was definitely one of those things like working at a hotel, like if I knew your name, that was a problem. Like it should have like the way it works, like you get your hope, like I give you your key. I know your name for like two seconds. You go to your room and I never see you again. Um, but if I have to know who you are, like something has gone wrong. Um, and so these, um, and so the people who were like staying there for lengths of lengths of time um, were 
I mean, legally, everybody there was homeless. Everybody who stayed there was homeless, right? Um, and so I got to, I got to know a lot of those people and trying to find ways to, to care. Um, and so that's one of the ways that I'm sort of asking myself um, is to write there, there, I guess they're all kind of love poems too, right? Um, but love poems to, yeah, love poems to these people who are, um, who, you know, followed through cracks, have been discarded, um, who I certainly did not love in the moment when I worked there, right? Um, like the 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 grandma who wrote uh who wrote these the the letters uh was just uh i fucking hated that lady um and and there was a while where when i had, was working there that um and it's one of the ways that, like i want to write these poems to improve myself a little bit was it like if there was a homeless person who was elderly or older it's like that just immediately had written that person off like that's a bad person that's a person who has a lot of family none of them want them in their lives nobody's willing to take this person into their life um that's got to be something is there's a reason for that um and i don't like that i don't like that about me um so i was trying to yeah i was just trying to work through that how have you been working with um i got i came in late i know you were uh you had read a couple poems about um your brother's incarceration yeah i mean i read a new one and i was had been telling um, the folks here that like the ones that are in the book were like I had I wrote them really quick uh, and it was towards more towards the end of when the book of the book project and like it was just like I thought about it so much or like I didn't let myself think about it like like uh, and and so then when I wrote those poems they just kind of came out of nowhere and 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 so I was surprised that this one about my brother being released was was so much more it came out a lot easier or something like I don't know like after the stuff in the book it was sort of easier to write about that situation and I don't know I don't know why but but I'm I'm interested in like I think because I'm not like you know I'm not just writing about the incarceration but I'm writing about like my relationship to my brother and things like that so yeah yeah it's yeah, my, my dad had worked for a long time with uh, with the youth authority um so I, yeah, writing about in, incarceration and, and loved ones who are incarcerated, have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, you think those, the only reasons those poems maybe came a little bit easier was that they're poems that had come after this probably you know, decade or more of like, really sort of like thinking through that these poetry writing processes and how do we put those things together and then you have that like mu not muscle memory but sort of muscle memory there and then moving through it uh, maybe i mean i think like everything anything i ever write or like anything anyone ever writes is sort of like it's even if it like you're like oh this sucks i'm never gonna publish it or show anybody like it's still like that is all still building towards like you know like like that's why sometimes you know your poems take you know years for for a poem to be done but sometimes like the next poem you might do it in like one sitting in like 10 minutes it's because it's not just like the 10 minutes that you took to write it. it's like everything that ever came before that that sort of like moved towards that and sometimes yeah like i don't like to work off of inspiration um, or trust only that but like sometimes when it when it struck for those poems about my brother I sort of let it and it both of them took me in these totally weird uh, routes both of those poems I'm thinking of from the book and and I think that was because of like everything I had ever been writing 
that this sort of helped push these other two poems out. There's definitely something to me, like, you know, there's the craft and then there's like the routine of writing. If you can do it, get it done. But then there's also like this sort of spiritual sense that I don't want to like deny, even though I like, I am very much in the academic academic world. So that's not like something like we talk about much or it feels like you shouldn't, but I really, it's, it is part of it. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's, it's hard to quantify, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, which, and then uh, I always forget that those poems are beautiful, man. Uh, it's Thanks. just incredible. Um, I forget to put compliments out into the world and, and, and say the good things, okay. uh, try to get better about it. I'm waiting for those. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. I'm <laughs> um, my love letters like, are coming my love letters are coming it's just lewis de joy is just holding on to them uh, I, have, I have like other things i want to say about the work but i don't know if anybody else has questions or other comments i don't want to just like take over it's okay to take over michael uh you know michael so in a way that most people don't and uh, please ask questions um i i, I don't know like i was wondering because i'm so interested in these like totally separate things because like to me like everything that i'm working on right now is like I just bunch it all together into like uh, it's like so many poems and they're all in like early draft stages and I don't know what's going on and I think you've been working on these projects for a long time so I'm so I'm thinking like do you see them as like the hotel poems and the acrostic work as different like collections like they would never be in the same collection because I actually think it could work where they're in the same collection like there's what because so what, what's really interesting to me I don't know if this is more of a question for me just trying to convince you to put it all into one collection, but um, I need to get a book out. So if you can convince me, I'm open to it. But because like, so the, the hotel poems, the voice, your syntax is so different from the uh, ekphrastic ones that you read. Um, sonically it's tighter in a way, but no less, um, no less like soulful. Like, and then mm. in the ekphrastic ones, it's so loose. Like, I love how you sort of described it. It's like these sketches. It felt like an essay in collage actually. And I really enjoyed that. And it was so different from the, the, the voice in the um, hotel poems. But I think there was, a, there was actually a lot of thematic overlap uh, when it came to like home and not having home and like also things about the body and love, like you mentioned. And so like, I don't know, I just, I just can totally see it working out um and also in a purely like um a, a, like a, in the mind of a reader or a screener or a judge like liking the idea of, of, of a mesh of these poems in one collection so that uh the hotel voice does not uh just overwhelm a, a reader and then you have these mix so these sort of tension and release within within those series yeah i, I definitely there they are conceived of as two different things um and the the craft that um that i'm trying to sort of um focus on and hone uh, in them is is definitely uh intentionally different um uh, the like the the hotel poems are absolutely trying to focus on uh, on lyric um, and um, and and yeah and that that, that just that the, the sonic tightness uh, of those um, whereas the ekphrastic ones there's a bit more freedom. And those right they're, they're definitely looser um but yeah I, i'll have to take a look at uh putting those like interweaving those things together um yeah, i'll send you an email yeah yeah continue I, part of the conversation but yeah because yeah. i need i need to get that book out and i mean uh, I, 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 I too I many like of my that. friends have won the poetry series <laughs> Uh, you won, and then I think Jake Skeets won. Yeah, before, yeah, he told me. Um, I was like, I had this, I'm helping these guys out too much. I got to get out. I mean, no, it's not, it's not, it's like, 
you know, the book, I, I just think that that's something interesting yeah. to at least explore. And so I was just like uh, interested in to knowing if you thought of them separate or, or meshed together, because, you know, as writers, we can get, we think about the certain projects we have and we think we can get into thinking of them in a certain way because we're trying to hone in, right? Uh, and so we can sort of at times get a tunnel vision about, about some thing or things. And so I just was wondering about that, especially because I like, I know you'd been working on like hotel, either stories or essays, but I didn't know you were doing poems. And then I knew the the ekphrastic, ekphrastic work had, you'd been doing that forever. And I, I feel like every time I hear you read from that, it's like the the project has like changed and like grown and gotten more, I think um, there's something more, not precise, but you're like carving away at it and shaping it. It's becoming like, I don't know, it's, it's moving along with your growth too. And that's been really cool to like see every few years that we pop up in the same reading, you know? Yeah. And it's definitely, it's, I, yeah. I definitely need to, at some point, right? Like the carving has to, the carving has to stop, right? Um, and I, I, I pick up something new to start carving away at. Um, so absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I think there's definitely, um, some tunnel vision that's happening. Cause I've seen the, uh, just seeing these two things as so separated. Right. Mm -hmm. But that also, yeah, but I, I, I cause I'm, I, I'm, I was talking to my dad about, uh, some of this a little while ago. Um, I usually don't talk about my, my poems with him, um, cause he, uh, features in them and mm -hmm. not always compl in a complimentary way. Um, but they're out there in the world for him to know that they, you know, if he ever wants to go looking for them. Um, and he brought up that it's like, you know, like you, you have these sort of you have these fractures that are happening in the way that these are constructed, but you have put these fractures together, right? You have made them whole. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, you're, you're mixed. Mm -hmm. You're, you have, you know, you've, and, and then he started telling me about my own life um which i don't know if anybody's ever had somebody tell you about your own life before but it was a very weird <laughs> <laughs> you're like i know i was there <laughs> I, yeah i was there the whole time <laughs> um and he was and, and so he he was reminding me and and giving me this way to look at these um these this poems of my and and a way to look at my own life where like i grew up in in claremont went to claremont high school which um pomona college isn't in pomona right um yeah it's they they, they put it in claremont um right uh, up the street from my house um claremont high school so routinely sends kids to uh like ivy league schools that they don't make a big deal about it um and I, but i went to i purposely went to to mount sac i didn't want to i didn't even want to try applying to anywhere else um not that i don't know if i could have gotten into like but um he's like so you you like you've had this you know this life like your friends are like your friends parents are rocket scientists and uh doctors and then my dad would take me out of school for a, like a month at a time. And we'd, and I'd, we'd go out and, you know, I'd be on these like month long road trips all over the Western part of the United States, up into Canada, uh, up into places like nobody can get to, nobody can go, go to these ceremonies. Um, I realized like a couple of weeks ago, like I grew up with, pe with people from the 1800s like who were born in the late 1800s. 
just surrounded by these like elderly older people which makes sense if you ever if you know because i'm uh, i've been old since i was 10 uh just a curmudgeonly old man since like in like before i got to middle school I'm like ah uh, but i like that as sort of like um as like a continuation of that right idea that putting these these things together right and in a way right it also it answers a question i've had about the the ekphrastic work which is a question that's um and and i uh and i love that this is becoming uh about me this is this is wonderful uh, <laughs> but um that so much of the those those works look into the past which is a huge concern i have and other people have about like native work and how people engage with native work right that it is all always in the past um right and so there's this really cool small but growing um part of like it's called it's called indigenous futurism but it's just imagining right like native people into the future right um and and it's one of the things that i've been wanting that i feel like the collection has been that the ekphrastic palms have been missing right have been this gesture towards the future um but having sort of just talked about why why write some of these hotel palms right is this sort of like gesture to future me, right? Trying to write myself into a future, a, uh, spiritually, emotionally, right? Where there's a, a focused and purposed, like care for people who it's hard to care for um or, or people who have sort of fallen through these cracks uh and and ways in which right like i let myself do that to me yeah i mean you and like you were writing yourself into the future but you also mentioned about how the the, the kids who were in the hotel might be your students so like you're thinking about their futures slash writing against their futurelessness if that makes sense too i don't know i just see a lot of overlap but um yeah, yeah. And, and i and i've heard like um from somewhere i don't remember who or which poet but it's like a lot of times like your like your first like the first two books could have actually been one book like 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 one more like comp complex or complicated books and I'm like, oh, like, what am I writing now? That that's like, what if it were the one thing? Like, what would it, what would be said? But I don't know how far I am from the next thing. So I'm just like, yeah. yeah. Well, and I don't know. Um, when we were when when you were at Mount Sac and at uh, and at um, UCR, had you ever tried? putting collections together and then just none of those poems appear in anything in anything new or in, the, in this collection you've got now um i have like no like i just i was i was writing so much like other writers when i first started like i was like trying to get my hands on anything so 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 much of my early work sounds like Bukowski and like and and but also want to be very accessible like Billy Collins and those are like the two top poets that like Bruce Williams was show, showing the students back then there's like one line in the book that's from a workshop at from the creative writing club at Mount Sac there's like one line that's like I, I cut I cut so much and I and I and I overwrote and then I cut so much down again it went it like was in flux for years um but I will say that like this it, it's very much the same sort of themes maybe same like sort of memories or experiences i'm writing about it's just like uh over the time when i just acquired different sort of craft techniques and like different like ways into a poem and out of a poem like i just 
they it, it, everything became you know um it, it just became um it was like brush strokes on top of the on top of what was what was there or whatever and something new came about it entirely it seems mm -hmm. uh, but like we've like i've said like i couldn't have the book without having written all the other things that i have written um which is also to say like it's cool and it's like sad because like a friend of mine says like you only have one you know like you, your first book is like a certain thing and you'll never do that you can never write that thing again and so I'm glad to have written this book but it's also like what I do now will be founded on top of the book I already have and so it's like interesting and like uh I don't know to see what the fuck is gonna happen I mean I'm just like talking about like the, the the fact that i like love writing the way i have you know for so long now yeah well because i had i had tried to put together some collections that i that just i don't even look at those poems anymore mm -hmm. um it's like by the time i went i started my mfa i had like written a book that i never wanted published oh yeah i mean and my first so chapbook i hope my first chapbook fucking i feel like everything i write now is in response to my first chapbook which is like so fucking um uh bad <laughs> but but also you know back then i didn't i didn't know what the public public publication literary world really looked like and it has changed so much too and you know i think john at the beginning of this was mentioning how you had like a publishing panel or something and i was like remembering like i remember being in I'm outside learning how to write a cover letter and all those things. Um, and then, and, and so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you're always trying to be a better version of yourself, as you said, challenge yourself to, yeah, to get, to be better at writing. And I suppose as a person, maybe that will naturally happen too. Hopefully, at least for myself. That's my hope for me, that I, I, write myself into a better version of myself or more i the, the idealized version of me mm -hmm. right the 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 me that i want to be right. um it's almost have to right it's almost a army slogan right yeah be the best you can be with poetry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh man, I got a whole bunch of stuff I gotta fucking do now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds like a great place to end. I mean, what 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 a great <laughs> final thought. Write yourself into the person you want to be. Uh, unless anybody else has has uh, any questions, or if you 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 two have more to say. It's a really gorgeous sentiment. Thank you so much, Michaelson and Michael. Thank you for having us, man. Yeah, this was great. Thank you all for being here.